Father, it is once again that we come before your throne. We just want to give you thanks, dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> yet for watching over us, dear Heavenly Father, as we travel home uh, this afternoon, and that you allowed us to return here safe, dear Heavenly Father, to uh, go into another study of your word. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will be with your man's servant, and dear Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us as we look into your word, dear Heavenly Father. And we ask, dear Heavenly Father, where yet we last lack knowledge, that you will give us knowledge where we lack understanding, that you will give us understanding, dear Heavenly Father, that we may learn, dear Heavenly Father, to speak your word as you would have it spoken. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Give thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Good evening, saints. Good to be back with you once again. Uh, good to be here to be able to talk about yet another portion of God's divine word. Good evening, good evening. We're going to jump right in. You know, uh, that's one thing that uh, we kind of do. We don't really waste time. <laughs> when it's time to get into the Lord's word, we just jump right in. No small talk. 
Okay, today we're going uh, to do a quick review uh, of our lesson on this morning so that we can have time uh, to discuss the assignment that was given today. There was an assignment that was given this afternoon, and we want to leave some time for that. So we are in Nehemiah, chapter number five, don't let Satan win, despite terror from within. Don't let Satan win, despite terror from within. As we noted, uh, we, we saw how uh, the uh, Jerusalem was, was taken over or was sacked, if you will, by uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Uh, but Jesus promised Jeremiah, Jesus, God promised Jeremiah that uh, the people will return and they will be gone for 70 years. So the historical context is that we're looking at the return of Israel and what they had to do to rebuild which is the theme of the lessons that we're going through is rebuilding. And we started off by taking a look at Zerubbabel. We didn't preach on him, but that is uh, Ezra chapter number one through six is all about Zerubbabel. He was the first wave. He brought the first wave back and his job was to rebuild the temple. He rebuilt the temple. He rebuilt some of the buildings and facilities and he had this grand program that was really designed to get things started. And then there was a 58 year gap between chapter six and chapter seven. Of, Ezra, of the book of Ezra, and we noted there when the temple was completed. And then Ezra came. Ezra came with the second wave. And then you'll find that in Ezra chapter 7, uh, chapter 7 going on through chapter is number 10. And Ezra's job was to rebuild the spiritual lives of the people, or at least get that process started. And then we had the third wave, which was Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes along and his job is to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city. And so we're looking at Nehemiah uh, because Nehemiah literally is a book about leadership, godly leadership. If you want to go into Zeru I mean, uh, Ezra, it's about revival. If you wanted to give a, a theme of these books, you would look at revival in Ezra. You would look at uh, uh, leadership in Nehemiah. And Zerubbabel says he rebuilt the temple, I guess you could say reestablishing God's presence. That was his job uh, when he got there. So that's kind of the historical context. And we, I know this is kind of small, but I wanted to give uh, a little bit of a, a picture for you so that you can see the gravity of the work that Nehemiah was doing. And his job, was, again, is to rebuild the walls. And you see there in the blue uh, triangles all the gates that had to be rebuilt. All that stuff was torn down and burned, and it was just a big mess. And it took years for them to rebuild. But this was the mission that God had sent uh, Nehemiah to do, because we know that Nehemiah was very disappointed in the condition of Jerusalem. And this one is just a little bit of a finer look at the walls themselves. This one talks a little bit about some of the various houses and where they were stationed. But I do encourage everyone to just glance through chapter 3 of the book of Ezra. Chapter 3 gives you a, a much more detail than this, this, this pictograph here, but a, but a really detailed explanation of all the families, all the, the clans, and where they were working, and it gives you uh, some uh, a, a sense of scale is what I was, the word that I was looking for. And so when we read in uh, chapter number 4 when he said that the trumpeteer, the man with the trumpet, or the uh, so forth, uh, shofar was next to him, you could see why, because the area was so large and, what, uh, and the work that they were doing to rebuild uh, these walls. And so the first lesson was the cause of the cupbearer, Nehemiah being a cupbearer. He is the, the stepson of Queen Esther. And his job was basically to make sure that the king's goblet was full of wine. And so we looked at the sorrow and the pain that he felt, and he had this cause, he had this yearning. And so he wanted to go and do something. And so the Nehemiah chapter number one really involved a prayer, uh, but it was just very, very uh, heartening to see how his feelings were towards uh, Jerusalem and what was going on. And then obviously we equated that to the ultimate cupbearer, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he had to bear a completely different cup, obviously. And then the second lesson was portrait of godly leadership. Here we brought out about 10 or 8 or so different principles that we saw with the beginning of the rebuilding of the wall and how they were attacked by Sambalot and Tobiah, who were like, I guess you could say, distant cousins or relatives, <clears throat> but various people 
that didn't like them coming in and changing the status quo, didn't like the fact that these Jews had the audacity to come in and want to rebuild things after they had by this time established their own political system or their own uh, ruling class, if you will. So they were very much against the work that Nehemiah uh, was doing. And so we took a lesson there, a portrait of godly leadership. And so then on today, we started to look at uh, this concept of when this wall was being rebuilt, the work of the Lord is ongoing, and then there was this problem that arose within the camp, within the people. And so we wanted to look at how Satan can rip up your family, rip up your home, rip up a church, rip up your marriage, rip up things on the inside. You know, sometimes trouble comes from the outside, but this is a case where trouble came from within. So 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 11, one of my favorite passages, if you want to start back at chapter, uh, verse number 5 but it's talking about forgiveness of an offender. But in verse number 11, the reason why Paul says that we need to do this, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. In other words, Satan could come inside the church if you don't forgive this brother. And he says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So this lesson was designed to take a look at some of Satan's devices, just kind of um, uh, generally but then look at how Nehemiah overcame those. In Ephesians chapter number 6, verse 10 and 11, uh, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wow. To the Corinthian church and to the Ephesian church, Paul sent messages about Satan entering into the churches or entering in amongst the people. And that is where that we draw our uh, lesson from on this, on, this, uh, uh, on this Sunday evening, looking at how Satan tried to get in uh, to, the, to the people of Nehemiah. So with that, we started off by talking a little bit about Satan, and we'll probably go over these in different forms over the days, months, and years, Lord willing, if God allows me to continue to preach, because you'll see all of these and more. These are just the Ds, but there's so many ways uh, or so many wiles of the devil and so many devices of the devil. And, and I have notes on every one of these and how Satan uses all of these in different forms and different, I guess you could say, frequencies or volumes or uh, uh, time periods. You know, one time is defilement, another time is distraction, another time is dishonesty, another time you might be getting dull, another time he'll put you in debt. Another time he'll delay your gratification. Another time he'll put doubt in your mind. Another time he'll get you with some discouragement or dis disappointment. Another time he'll just make you seem a little bit double-minded. I mean, he, the wiles of the devil, the way he comes at you. Again, this is internal. Sambalot and Tobiah were in chapter 4. And it appears that uh, uh, although we're not done with them in, the, in, in this lesson series, chapter 5 has nothing to do with them. This is all stuff in-house, so to speak. And so we wanted to just let it be known that Satan is out there and he's going to continue to try, especially if you're trying to do the work of the Lord and try to rebuild the walls in your life or in your marriage or in your business or whatever you're trying to do, he's going to come at you in many, many uh, different ways. So let's go to the text, Nehemiah chapter number 5, verse 1 through 19. There's a lot of passages, but we'll read them. We'll just take a few points, and then we'll go into the assignment that we have for this evening. Verse number one. And there was a great what? Cry. A great cry. It's an adjective. It's not a regular cry. This is something where it's everybody's crying. Everybody's voicing their disapproval. They're, 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 they're upset. A lot of things. Remember the scale and the scope of the work that they're doing. So if the work was great, imagine when the word of God says it was a great cry of the people and their wives against their brethren, the Jews. That's why it's highlighted in a different color, because it sets the immediate context that this is an internal thing. There's no Sambalot and Tobiah in this text. There's no enemies on the external enemies in this text. This is a problem that's within the family. Verse 2. For there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them, that we may eat 
and live. In other words, everybody's working on these walls. Everybody's doing the Lord's work, but there's so many people. We need so much food. We need so much everything just to sustain this work because it's been going on for days and weeks and weeks, and we need to uh, uh, feed the people. Verse number three. Some also there that, uh, were, uh, that said, we have mortgaged our lands. In other words, they sold our lands. We sold our vineyards, and we sold our houses. This that we might buy corn because of the dearth. And that word dearth literally means what, brethren? There was a famine going on. So there's already not a lot of food. There's already not a lot of food. Now you've rallied the troops. You've rallied the church. There's a cause, Brother, brother, uh, brother T. There's, there's, there's a mission. Everybody's bought into the mission. But now we're starting to struggle a little bit. And so to sustain the mission, people were selling their lands and their vineyards and, and their homes just so that they can eat. So now you can get some gravity of this problem. But it's not done yet. Verse 4, for they also said, now when I went back and studied these, I made notes that this was kind of issue one. Well, all of this is a great cry to people, but issue one, issue two, and then issue three starts at verse 4. There were also that said, we have borrowed. Now, there have already some that have sold everything. And those that didn't have anything to sell had to turn right back around and borrow. We have borrowed for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. These are the ones that didn't have to sell them yet, but they already took out second, law, second mortgages, Lord have mercy. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brother. In other words, we all together, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought unto bondage Already, some of this has been interpreted to me that they may have been sold. They, you know, I didn't want to go there. I just wanted to stay with the text. But it, it literally uh, speaks about how um, the the women, or not just the women, but the children, everyone was kind of getting tangled up in this web of issues that was created within. And this is part of the great cry. Neither is it our power to redeem them or buy them back or release them from their debts. For other men have our lands and vineyards. <clears throat> Obviously, this reaches Nehemiah in verse 6, and he says, and I was very angry. I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers. In other words, these are the wealthy people. They're Jews. They're within the same family. I would presume that even these nobles and rulers were also part of trying to rebuild the walls. They had bought into it. Everybody's working together. You have these outside folks, Sambalot and Tobias and all these other ones that are against them. But this is the in-house. And then he says, you exact usury, which is what? Interest that was against the Mosaic law. You exact usury every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. Verse 8. And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will you even sell your own brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? In other words, Nehemiah says, wait a minute, what is going on? At the end of verse 8, it says, then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. I also, I said, it is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses. Also the hundredth part of the money, in other words, every penny, and of the corn, the wine, and the oil that ye exact of them. 
Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them, so we will do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Also I shook my lap and said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that is, 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the, tape, eaten the bread of the governor, but the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine beside 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I because of the fear of the Lord. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither brought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers, besides those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox, and an ox, if y'all ever seen an ox, I tried to get a, a picture of it, but I just ran out of time. One whole big fat ox and six sheep, also fowl, that would be chickens and turkeys and you know, birds, and also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required I not the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. In other words, he was not going to get uh, these provisions from the governor, because the governor was getting them from taxes on the people. He said, I'm not going to take anything from the governor, because he's taking it from the people. But I love the verse 19, and brother and I really struggled up until last night of where the theme was going to be in the title of this lesson. Because when I first read it, my heart was with verse 19. Verse 19, he says, think upon me, my God. That was going to be the lesson. Think upon me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. We didn't really get to develop verse 19, but I just thought verse 19 was like the kicker. So that is the text that we looked at, and I wanted to now open it up for any comments, questions, or thoughts. Uh, what do you see happening in the lesson? Where are we at in the lesson? And what leadership qualities did Nehemiah show, number one? And if we don't have any comments or thoughts on that, let's just go right into our assignment. We went through this already this morning. I did have about seven points that we brought up that that Nehemiah that we saw in the text, uh, but keeping true to our uh, theme, uh, we want to go into that which, uh, which has to do with Jesus. But let me give these real quick. One was uh, leadership in action, having the ability for tactical rebuke. That was going back to verse number six. Then I have a bunch of scriptures there that we didn't get a chance to go into on this afternoon. Then number two was having a constant spiritual mind. That was verse 7 and 8, where he uh, consulted with himself and rebuked the nobles and then the rulers, <coughs> and then uh, talked about uh, redeeming everything that was sold. And after, for that, I went into Galatians chapter number 5. I really wanted to go through each one of those uh, fleshly things, uh, you know, fornication, uncleanliness, witchcraft, idolatry, because all of that could be at play in some form. Now, here, I would say the primary motive was greed. But greed is part of, you know, your fleshly failure. You know, you see your brethren in a famine, they're having to sell their lands, they're, they're just trying to buy food, but you see a way to make money. Not that you didn't have a right to loan them the money or whatever you did, but you were charging them. You were profiting off of their suffering. Uh, so that was uh, one of the other points. Then uh, we looked at leadership in action, uh, point number three, is having a healthy fear or reverence of the Lord. That went into uh, verse number nine. Also went to Proverbs 1, 7, Proverbs 8, 13, and uh, Matthew 10, 28. 
And then the next one was having a mind of self-examination. Uh, that was uh, in uh, Nehemiah 5, verse number 10, when he says, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of the money and the corn. Uh, for this, I was going to go into confession. 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 9, James chapter number 5, verse number 16, and then Proverbs 28, verse number uh, 13. And then after that, we looked at repentance, how uh, Nehemiah repented, uh, and, the, and the, the rulers and nobles also repented. Uh, that was in verse 11 and 12. And then uh, we were going to, we went into commitment to the cause, commitment to the cause, which was verse uh, 13. And then really I didn't get, we didn't get to finish uh, the rest because we just were running out of time. But I wanted to open it up right now for this lesson, but then also to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have some, some, some things that I jotted down that, that really spoke to Jesus' leadership during crisis. And the assignment for you guys was to think about the life of Jesus, think about the ministry of Jesus, and think about some times where he too was dealing with things in crisis and how he exhibited qualities or characteristics of a great leader, because Jesus is the great leader. But what things come to your mind that we can, again, uh, make an application? Because all of this that we're looking at with, uh, uh, with Jeremiah and not letting Satan win, despite the terror within, Jesus went through the same thing because it was the Jews that were trying to kill him. So it was in the family. So what kind of things, and then if you want to expand it, which is where I was really going with this, Brother Tony, I didn't have time, was how sometimes even in the church, we don't help one another. We'll have a church right across town. The doors are falling off, uh, broken this, broken that, and you got a church within 10 minutes drive with millions in the bank, and they won't help. Now, I was going to go back and talk about that, and we should if you guys want to. This is an open floor. But I was going to go back into the book of Acts and the book of Galatians when Paul said, let us go back through Galatia. Why? To strengthen the churches. Now, you, we can argue over what that word strengthen means, Brother Tony. But I believe that in Paul's mind, that meant whatever. If you need to go there and preach, if you need to go there and teach, if you need to go there and pray, if you need to go help them establish elders, if they had a broken down building, if they didn't have any Bibles, whatever strengthen means. That's why Paul, they made a U-turn. And remember when, when he and Silas went this way and Barnabas and, and Mark started at the other end. And so th there was a lot in this lesson, brother, and we just didn't have time to uh, explore it or unpack it in the time that we had available today, but we don't have that restriction right now. <laughs> so any thoughts or comments on, on what's been thrown out so far? Brother Dash, you grabbed the mic first. I know Brother Keith's brain is over there itching. <laughs> so, go ahead, no, Brother so, Dash. So two things. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to go back to um, when you were preaching earlier, you brought something something to my mind when you talked about David, and I believe when you said his Nathan, mm -hmm. am I, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it instantly brought to my mind, so over the weekend, I had an issue with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, she made me upset, mm -hmm. all right? And she FaceTimed me, and it got to a point where I got upset, and I hung up on her, right? Okay. But I was angry, right? Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, my friend called me, a friend mm -hmm. from the Navy, mm -hmm. and the way I answered the phone, he said, hold on, brother, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and I told him what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Got off the phone with him. Um, he called me back five minutes later, and what he told me, he gave me advice. He said, I want to give you some advice. Listen to me. And he talked to me, and he kind of calmed me down. He said, you should apologize to your daughter. Amen. Love your children, wow. you know, so forth, so forth. Beautiful. Beautiful. But it took, I was already in the process of coming down, but when he, he came, yeah. it just solidified it. And mm -hmm. instantly, mm -hmm. I texted my daughter and I apologized to her. Yeah. So he was like my Nathan at Amen, that moment. Brother. You know, I thought about that. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> going into the assignment, 
and I thought about the difficult times that Jesus went through, I, w I instantly went to John, give me a second, I want to say John 14. Mm -hmm. And so verse 1, when he says, let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when Christ said that, I take that as, I know we're going to worry. You know we're going to worry. We're going to have yes. times where we're sorrowful. Yes. But don't dwell in that sorrow, That's right? right? That's right. And so you know he meant that because then when you go to Matthew mm -hmm. 26, mm -hmm. and beginning at verse 37, it says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began wow. to be sorrowful and very heavy. Mm -hmm. All right? And Christ said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto the death. Tear ye here and watch with me. But if you go ahead and read down, the first thing that Christ did, he went to God in prayer. Yes, sir. Right? And I believe he went to God in prayer three times because of his sorrow. And so to me, that was like the ultimate example of leadership of he's showing you what do you do when you're in time of sorrow. Don't dwell on it. Go to God for deliverance. So that's, those are the things that came to my mind. Amen. Amen, Brother Dash. That's excellent. I'm glad that your brother called you. <laughs> and I'm glad you had a humble enough spirit to hear and kind of realize and say, dang, man, you know what? I was wrong. Let me, let me, let me fix this. And that's what we see even in the text. Even in the text. And that's what we're saying when we talked about that tactical rebuke. He just said, wait a minute, man, something don't sound right. Let's, let's talk about this. You need to call her. Nehemiah, I believe, it's back in the day. Uh, <laughs> it's back in the day. I don't know if you all remember this, but when you had, used to have your brand new white kicks on and somebody would come and step on your shoe. Okay, there's two ways this can go. <laughs> I mean, we're, we were young and dumb and full of fire. And, you know, man, you scuff up my shoes. You know, we're going we, 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 we to talk about this. Especially if you're in a club or something and you're trying to impress some ladies and now you got a big old scuff mark on your shoe. Well, not to get too far on that, but the point is that there was two ways you could go with that. The same thing when we used to fix up our low riders and somebody would sit on your car and there's two ways this can go. How dare you, Brother John, sit on my classic that I just spent four hours polishing. There's two ways where this could go. So let's, let's go now to Brother T. <clears throat> I just um, was sitting here thinking about Nehemiah and, and the whole process that we've gone over it, that how, um, first of all, you know, the love he had for his people. Uh -huh. That yeah. here he is in another foreign land. He's all right. And he's doing well. Mm -hmm. But he, he had a concern about how they were doing. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, his love for his fellow men, because when he heard the report, mm -hmm. it, it, it affected his heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so much to the point now that, um, once again, he had prayed about it. Mm -hmm. Once again, the king noticed mm -hmm. that there is something wrong mm -hmm. with Nehemiah, to the point that Nehemiah goes back. And then we were looking at it and saying, and, 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 and I guess the thing where you put like godly leadership, mm -hmm. because we, we can have leadership, <laughs> you know, but we're Amen. saying godly leadership, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and so when you look at that godly leadership, you know, of Nehemiah, even if you compare that with Christ, mm -hmm. it was sacrificial. That's right, Tony. It, it, it wasn't like, what can I get out of this? What mm -hmm. can I build myself mm -hmm. up to be, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so even like you said, when he thought about the people and, and, and you can see that, Hey, look, here's a problem. He was decisive in it to address the issue. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> these people are crying. These people are doing all this. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about, because back in the law, I think in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God told them not to exact use not to. from their brethren. That even goes back to the year of Jubilee and all of that. Yes. Go ahead, brother. You know, so, <clears throat> so we can look at that. Here is mm -hmm. something that God has uh, uh, instituted. Yes. Mm -hmm. And once again, we're doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when I look and I think about people 
we talk about why the world is so bad. Mm -hmm. The world, we blame God, but the world is not bad because of God. No. The world is bad because of us, the things that we do. You know, even once again, if we just took that example of Nehemiah, hey, look. All, look at you nobles, you rulers, and all this. Of all you're doing for your gain, for you. Making bank, Tony. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and you're not considering. Fleecing the people. <laughs> your, your brethren. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it makes mm -hmm. you think when God has established something. That's right. Tony. God established something that was fair. That's right. You know, as you said, when you look back into the Jubilee mm -hmm. when, and, and, and see how God had done that, mm -hmm. how he had set that up, mm -hmm. how he said, look, you know, you don't take their land forever. That's right. You don't take them forever. That's right. You know. Where he's, you know, and he, he set up this structure. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so when we see that God is saying, you know, uh, uh, David said, I can never see the, uh, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing the children of God wanting mm -hmm. for anything. Because mm -hmm. God had established mm -hmm. a way that we can all be taken care of. Right. We, right. we still had poor. It's right. not like we were all equal. Right. But nonetheless, yeah. whatever their needs were That's that right. needed to be addressed, they got addressed. You know, Tony, I'm glad you mentioned that because there was even in the law that you were not to glean the edges of your field. You had to leave the edges of your field to the poor folk. It was either in the seventh year or the 49th year, I can't recall, but you had to give the land a rest. You were not allowed to harvest for a whole year. You had time to store up for that year. God was saying, look, we even need to give the land a rest. So I'm glad that you brought that up because God's plan was always there. It's always been right. It's always been good. There's always been a benefit from it. And I do like the, the correlation between Jesus and Nehemiah. And I have a, a few thoughts on that. But the main thought, because all of it sums up into one, because <laughs> we can talk about the love. We can talk about how Jesus always spoke the truth by him rebuking the Pharisees, same thing with Nehemiah, he spoke the truth, you know, there's a lot of parallels. But the main one, the main one, to me at least, is that they both exhibited signs of servant leadership. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. Y'all don't heap all this on me. I came to serve. Now look at Nehemiah. As Tony said, although he was in captivity, Brother Jim, he's a cup pair, bro. He probably had some pretty good quarters. Even when he got into Jerusalem, he probably had the good blankets, Brother, 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 uh, brother T., he probably had nice things. You know, he was taken care of because now he's the governor. But like you said, or someone said, his heart was with the people. He came to serve the people. And I find that an amazing parallel. Brother Jim. Oh, OK, uh, uh, Leida, Jim, and then Sister Whitley. Well, I was looking at the part where he, you said he was constant but spiritual mind. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about how Jesus, you know, Satan always comes to us through in 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the yes. pride of life. And in Matthew, the fourth chapter, when, he, when Jesus was in the wilderness, mm -hmm. that's how Satan how came at him. Amen. And he constantly kept saying, mm -hmm. it is written. Mm -hmm. It is written. Mm -hmm. So that was his, his mind. He always had that spiritual mind. That's right. So every time Satan attacked him, that's right. he was going back to what the word mm -hmm. said. That's right, Sister, uh, Sister Diana. You remember in that uh, Matthew 4, what was the first thing he hit Jesus with? Y'all remember? Food. He <laughs> said, hey, Jesus, ain't you hungry? <laughs> You've been out here for 40 days and for I know you've been missing them, them honey buns and ribs. And I know you're missing all that, Jesus. Here's some rock, rocks right here, some stones. Turn those into bread. He hit him where he felt that Jesus was more vulnerable. That's the point. Uh, Brother Jim and then Sister Whitley. Yeah, I was almost right to where the was, but at that same incident, it's uh, that Satan tried to to persuade him or or with all the all the kingdoms. Yeah. So, you know, you can have you can have all this. Yes. And of course, Jesus didn't go for it. Mm -hmm. That same thing with Nehemiah. Once he got into that status, mm -hmm. he could have been taking sliced a little bit here on the side yeah. and 
And this is that, but he didn't. And so much that he recognized That's right. that the foreign folks were getting dogged out That's and right. everything, you know. That's right. But he, and, and no, nobody would have known but God, you know. Mm-hmm. He, he had his ox and, and he was yeah. he was well to do. And, yeah. you know, let me get a little bit more over here, you know. Yes. And then, so yeah. he stayed focused. That's and, right. and I'm sure Satan had to tempt him some time because mm-hmm. he's no different than none of us. It's mm-hmm. not probably written, it's not written, but mm-hmm. Satan, Satan's always there. Mm-hmm. You know, look at all this stuff you're getting, man. You know, everybody you're getting this. You know, so, and, and he didn't fall for it. That's you know, right. and he, matter of fact, he went a step further and started looking up for the f- poor folks and started getting with the, with the governors mm-hmm. and stuff. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of put that between where That's Jesus right. turned Satan around when he tried to tempt him and uh, how he just stayed on the course. Mm-hmm. And then I just think, in the, for Jesus being a leadership, I think the ultimate leadership when he was on the cross Amen. and he told the Father, Forgive them. They know not what they do. Amen. That, that, you know, that's, that's a leadership right there. You know, that's because right. after that's all right. he been through, and we kind of hit that earlier in the, in the, in the Sunday school mm-hmm. class about mm-hmm. all these, you know, these killings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Could we forgive mm-hmm. or could we be with mm-hmm. these people that are taking our loved ones mm-hmm. and stuff? Mm-hmm. And Jesus showed the example. So and you know, it's, it's hard for him. But it was like it was hard for him, though, Jesus and stuff, you know. But it would be hard for for me. I could put myself there. You know, so. I, 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 I feel where you're going because was it hard for him? I think no and yes. What, 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 what do you mean no and yes? No because he was focused. But yes because he said, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup from me. He said, but not my will. Your will be done. So, yes, so I, I do think. And real quick before we get to Sister Whitley, I was listening to Brother Vils this morning. And he, before he started his lesson, his lesson this morning was on Romans 12, verse 1 through 3, one of our favorite texts. But he was talking about the importance of Bible studies. And he was encouraging the congregation down there in Louisiana to begin going back to Bible studies, getting back into Bible studies. He was, he was saying it's like probably the most important thing you could do as a Christian is to attend Bible studies. And if you can't attend every week, try to make it every other week or whatever time because that's where you grow. Uh, sermons are fine. Sermons are okay. You learn from those. You're encouraged from those. You're uplifted from those. But if you really, really want to get deep into the word, you have to attend Bible studies. So, Sister Whitley, let's go, Sister Whitley. Um, it was pretty much what you were saying about serving others. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in Nehemiah, I think it's in 4, 6, mm-hmm. you know, he's getting his hands dirty. He says, so we built the wall. Yes. And in 4, I think it's 21, it's probably a whole bunch of places, but mm-hmm. it says, so we labored mm-hmm. in the work. And... Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus, you know, served others. He's the son of God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. And he washes the apostles' feet. Yeah. And he humbles himself, but yet he serves. And then in, uh, I think it's Mark 10, where he says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentile tiles lord it over them, and the great one exercises authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that was the ultimate. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm going back to what you were saying about, just, just for a second, if you guys can paint a mental, mental picture of Jesus physically washing people's feet. Mm-hmm. Let's let that sit for a minute. Humility. Remember who he was. Mm-hmm. But he was giving them a A1 class. This is like uh, Servanthood 101. Let me wash all of your feet, not just one. And one of them said, not just my feet, Lord, my body also, Peter. But Jesus got down there and washed their feet. And what did we say about that? Just real quick before we go to, uh, I think Brother Keith had a, a mic or something. But what do we say about feet washing? Why did they do that? Why did they need to wash their feet? What was so important about that? Because everywhere they walked, mm-hmm. yeah, they had the sandals on. It was dusty. That's right. 
That's so right. when you would get somewhere, your feet would be pretty dirty. Pretty dirty, and yes. so that was a courtesy when you mm -hmm. went to someone's house. Amen. Yeah. But you mm -hmm. went to someone's house, mm -hmm. they would walk, and it was a sign of them greeting you, respecting right. all that's of right. that. Um, but that's it right. was that's a task that was given to the lowest, the lowest, uh, servant the lowest. Yeah. I mean, if you had, let's say, if you had 500 slaves, or 100 slaves, or 10 slaves, and if you gave somebody the job of the feet washer, that's lower than the cook. That's lower than the farmhand. That's lower than the person that makes up your bed. That's lower than the person that does the laundry. That's lower than the person that, that follows behind you with the big fan shooing the flies away. You actually have to wash people's feet. And, uh, and as Sister Whitley said, it was a lot of caravans. It was a lot of dusty roads. I mean, you know, they didn't have, you know, uh, uh, Delta and Southwest Airlines and all that. You, you <laughs> You were either walking or you were on a camel or an ox or something, but it was dusty trails. And when you got to someone's house, it was customary that there was someone there to wash your feet. So Jesus took that most lowly job and showed that to his, his apostles. I think somebody else, before we get to Jim, was it Keith or Sister, Sister D? No, I, I didn't get a chance to stay to the whole service. Uh -huh. But when I, when I think about, like, from the beginning when we started to... Um, learn about Nehemiah and the mm -hmm. whole leadership yeah. piece. Uh, what struck me, and just like with everything I try to do, mm -hmm. not always thinking, but yeah. to start everything out in prayer. Amen. Right? And we Amen. also touched bases this morning about mm -hmm. motive behind what we do. Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. um, the motive behind Nehemiah That's was right. pure. Pure. It was yes. honest. Mm -hmm. You know, he cared about the people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like an I thing. Right? right? It right. was a we Yes. And when we talk about, you said, you spoke about um, servant leadership. Mm -hmm. He, too, like Sister Whitley say, mm -hmm. was involved, yes. right? It was yes. not like to give orders. He was a governor, yes. you yes. know? So he, had, he was a man of status. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the hum humility of it all is he worked along with his people, he got involved. right? He reassured yes. him. Mm -hmm. He surveyed in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. People didn't know who he was, right? right? So when right. we're set out on a mission, just like when we are teaching lessons and, mm -hmm. and um, doing things for Christ, mm -hmm. we can't go in halfway. Halfway. Right? But we do understand that all of us start from a certain place in our spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. Some of us have more knowledge than others mm -hmm. because maybe they were in the church, you know, longer, longer than yes, others. that's right. Right? But it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't have a significant role. Amen. Right. Amen. But also there is a reassurance piece. You know, mm -hmm. um, we need to be encouraged mm -hmm. through our journey. Mm -hmm. Right. We need mm -hmm. to be uplifted. Mm -hmm. We talked about um, supplications and intercessions this yes. morning also mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and having someone to petition, you know, yes. um, for us in prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Go to God in prayer, not mm -hmm. only us praying, but others praying for us, which is so powerful. Right. And believing and having the hope because you can pray and think, oh, everything's going to stay the same. And again, who wants that prayer, right? It has to be a hope behind Amen. it. So um, again, Amen. ultimately, he wanted to please God. That's right. You know? And then right. toward the end of this chapter, I believe verse 19, which stuck yeah. with me also, mm -hmm. uh, when mm -hmm. he said, remember me, my God, for remember good me. according to all that I have done for this people. Yes. Prayer again, right? Um, yes. Talking to um, God. Mm -hmm. on behalf of his people you mm -hmm. know it's not about him that's right you know he was given a mission mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and um with all that type of leadership yeah right um yeah. he was able to achieve that's so right. it's a beautiful story oh man it is wonderful it's wonderful sister d and you're talking about verse 19 i'll tell you guys what happened after we finished services on sunday I went home, and you know, sometimes I take a break, sometimes I don't. <laughs> but I went right back into the Bible because in my mind I'm thinking, okay, let me get a, a, a advanced look. Where are we going to go next week? And Brother Tony, I zeroed in right here on verse number 19. That's probably a whole lesson in and of itself, but I thought if we focused on that, we would kind of you know, maybe not have time to develop some of the other things that really occurred throughout the whole chapter. But verse 19, Sister D, I agree with you a thousand percent. Look at what he says. Think upon me, my God, 
for the good according to all that I have done for this people. I don't think that that was a selfish prayer. I think it's kind of like uh, the prayer of uh, uh, Jabez. Remember we talked about the prayer of Jabez when he asked God to uh, uh, widen or broaden his borders? I don't think that that was a prayer for riches and land and money. He was talking about his influence. He was talking about how he could impact people. He was, he was, he was praying for that. But when we see this prayer here, Again, I think he's just saying, Lord, look at what's happening down here. Look at what's going on. Again, Sambalot and Tobias, uh, we, now we got strife internally. Lord, look at what I'm trying to do. Remember me. So that's kind of how I take it. Remember me, God, as I try to strive to satisfy you and help lead these people. I think who helped, who, uh, Brother Jim and then Brother John. Mine's, mine's quick. I just I always want to go back where we say, uh, we were saying that cleaning people's feet, man, seen as the lowest job. Mm -hmm. But that's how Jesus. But Jesus once again, he's seen as the highest mm -hmm. compliment, uh, the highest compliment that you can give your brother. One yes. of us, mm -hmm. show it by example. Mm -hmm. So it is, and it's what goes where our thoughts is not uh, the thoughts and our ways is not God's ways. Mm -hmm. You know what we think is, oh, that's nasty doing his feet, and yeah. Jesus seeing that that's the best that's thing beautiful. you can do. Yeah, yeah. And not only sure, too. It's and and example, remember, who is that? Example. Mary with the jar of alabaster oil when she was anointing Jesus with her hair? They was like, wait a minute. We could have sold that stuff, man. You see, what is this lady doing? But Jesus knew what she was doing. But everybody else didn't know. Brother John. Remember me <laughs> to use me for the good mm -hmm. of all these people. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Amen. 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 Uh, we are getting close to the hour. We're actually there. Let me just, for those that are taking notes, let me give you some of the things that I had kind of noted. Uh, does somebody else have a comment? Keith had one. Oh, Keith. I, mean, I had a comment, but Keith. Okay. Yeah, I'll, let's, I'll make, let's I'll make a quick, quick. quick Daryl. Okay. I'll make quick. Mm -hmm. i just like to say it's good to see how the Holy Spirit worked on this man called mm -hmm. Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. um, he almost like, it's so beautiful, it's almost like it's a purpose. The purpose in it was to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He came from a cupbearer to mm -hmm. a governor. Mm -hmm. He came from a governor to an intercessor. Mm -hmm. He be, even became a warrior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's amazing how he even, uh, and, okay, I'll, go real, I'll be real quick with this. Mm -hmm. I was very, I'm, I'm talking about uh, five, six. Mm -hmm. I was very angry when I heard their cry mm -hmm. of these words. I consulted within myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I had to pull myself back. <laughs> you, know, you know, I had to go in my room go and, my, and beat up my pillow. Let me go in my cry room. And, and, and I had to think on this. <laughs> yes. I said, I consulted with myself and mm -hmm. I rebuked the nobles. Don't, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see this as kindly. I don't see that this is being a mild rebuke. Mm -hmm. I think he was, his people were calling out. Yes. We're selling our kids. Mm -hmm. We're losing our lots. Mm -hmm. we're, we're starving here yes. to build this wall. Yes. And, and that's a promise that Nehemiah didn't make. Mm -hmm. But greed, as you said, set in. And mm -hmm. I just like to take it so far as, as to say Nehemiah was a, a great intercessor. Amen. He Amen. prayed. Mm -hmm. He before he did anything, you notice that he prayed. That's right. And I, I could, I, 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 I go along with that and put it into context with Jesus. Jesus always prayed. Always. He's always. He didn't just pray for himself. He prayed mm -hmm. for us. That's right. That's right. He, you know what he did was for us. Amen. John seventeen, the Lord's yeah. prayer. Yeah. What? What? <clears throat> what? Mm -hmm. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he mm -hmm. prayed for us. Mm -hmm. He even told us told uh, some of the disciples, hey, y'all, what, what y'all doing sleeping? <laughs> y'all should be praying. <laughs> Amen. You know, intercessory prayer, I, yes. I, I believe in prayer. I, you know, I'm a, I know I'm a product of prayer. Amen. But the thing Amen. about it is, 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 you know, we, to look at this and to see leadership mm -hmm. and to see him stand fast on what God has promised him. Mm -hmm. He saw God working. Mm -hmm. God sent him into uh, J Jerusalem. I think mm -hmm. it's Israel and 
Mm -hmm. Started mm -hmm. building this wall. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. creeping around the camp. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows this man. That's right. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful. It's just a, a beautiful thing on leadership. How to believe in Christ. Yes, sir. Believe in what Christ has given you. Amen. Not someone Amen. else. I, I I can't be on the pulpit like you, Daryl. <laughs> but I could do right. what I can for Amen. Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, but I, I can't I can't be a Jimmy or, or Carmen, mm -hmm. but I could be Keith. Amen. That's you all know? you're supposed to be. And, and that's mm -hmm. that's the example I see because mm -hmm. you know it's it's just an amazing thing. You you know everybody want a headline, mm -hmm. but you know somebody got to get in the ditch. Hey hey, what, what, who, who got picked? That's right. When Moses was out there in the wilderness, mm -hmm. God said God said I got a man for you. He's way back here mm -hmm. in the in. In the in, in the cabinet, I've yeah. been teaching them how to make metal. That's right. He's gonna make my right. he's gonna make my tabernacle. That's right. So they, I, I keep I don't think anybody heard what you said at the end there. What was we that? We're gonna have to go back and break that out. What was that? <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll break that one out. But what Keith was referring to is when God gave Moses the commandment Amen. to build the original tabernacle. God had a man amongst the people that Moses didn't even know. I believe his name is Belazael. He said, go and see Belazael. He is a man that is gifted in all manners of metals and workings, and, and I have filled him with my spirit. So sometimes God has placed someone in your life that you don't even know they're there. And then all of a sudden, there they are, and they're your right-hand man. So let's go to Brother T real quick. I just want to bring out, uh, when you look in there, uh, Nehemiah's understanding of God, mm -hmm. who God is. Yes, sir. His place mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. and that to understand that all my blessings mm -hmm. come from God above. Amen. When, Amen. when you went back and read that, it made me think about Moses mm -hmm. when he had gone <clears throat> and, and, and fought to get Lot and them back. That's right. And, and, okay. and he wouldn't accept anything from them because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he was, he's like, my blessings come from God. That's right. And I don't want any of you to say, you made me rich. That's right. You know, so. <clears throat> That's right. Even us, it's, it's like sometimes we forget because we look at, hey, look, my, my blessings came from my hard labor I've hmm. done. My <laughs> blessings come from what I've done with this. Not mm -hmm. knowing that God is in the plan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we tend to forget those things where we get to the point that we're like those rulers and those noblemen mm -hmm. of that time. Mm -hmm. Is because, once again, we're not looking on the betterment of all mankind or for, or for the church. We're looking yeah. on for ourselves. what benefits me. That's right. And there was one other person, Brother, Brother Tony, just to follow up with what Brother Tony said. Um, it had to do with David and Aruna. Y'all remember Aruna? Aruna owned the, fleshing, the threshing floor where Jerusalem was eventually built. And remember, uh, David was given a choice, as Brother Jim help me with this, uh, three days of pestilence or famine or, you know, I can't remember the three choices for his sins. And David said, oh, no, Lord God, I don't want to be left at the hand of my enemies. Let me take your judgment your, because you are fair. But at the end of that, David goes to sacrifice to God on the threshing floor of Aranaz, where they separate the wheat and the chaff. And Aranaz said, here, I'll give you the goats and stuff for you to sacrifice. David said, <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, no. He says, I'm going to pay you because I will not sacrifice to God that which costs me nothing. When I read that, man, it just jumped off the book. It jumped off the page. David said, no, I'm not accepting free stuff from you that I'm going to turn around and give to God. He says, no, I'm going to pay you for that. Okay, let's go to uh, Sister Whitley. You know what? I can't re quite remember, so you've got to help me. Uh -huh. But verse 19, re it seems to me like he's just, he's not bragging on himself. He's just saying, you know, I've done good, and yes. I'm just asking for mercy. Yeah. And it reminds me of Hezekiah. I can't remember if it was because he was going to die. Or yes. What, what is it when he puts the letter, the 
uh, he was going to do an offering, right? No, he spreads out like letters or something. Are, is he mm -hmm. going to get attacked or is he going to die? But he's, okay. he's telling God, you know, I've done this. Yes, he's not yes. bragging. He's just yeah. saying. He's pleading. Yeah, he's pleading mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. him. And that's what that reminds me Amen. of. Amen. You know what I felt, also felt here? That you guys know how when you get home after a long day's work, You've been working hard, you've been working tired, and, you, and you just, you're just tired. You know, you're just a heavy load. You finally get to take them shoes off. Your corns is hurting. <laughs> you get into your home. It's like, oh. it almost seems like at the end of chapter four and at the end of chapter five, he finally gets to a place where he could take his shoes off. And he just says, Lord, whatever you do from here on out, because we're not done with this. We're, <laughs> we're just in chapter five. It's just like he said, okay, Lord, I, just remember me. <laughs> just remember me, Lord. I'm, I'm trying. These folk, is gonna, gonna, they're going to give me headaches. They're going to make me strike the rock like Moses. No, I'm just joking. But um, let's real quick go for those that are taking notes. Uh, I'm gonna, I, there was a few points that I wanted to talk about Jesus and his examples of leadership. I think uh, the pinnacle of that is we talked about servant leadership. I think there were a lot of good comments on that. But the other one was, number one, Jesus always spoke the truth. And that goes back to uh, when he was talking to the um, scribes and Pharisees. He called them a brood of vipers in Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 34. The second one was Jesus asked for more, but then he offers more. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So then he asks for more of us, but then he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Wait a minute, Jesus, you gave me something, but now you're asking me to do something else that's even greater. The next one was that Jesus values us. I think valuing the services and contributions of other people is a mark of leadership. How many of, of you have ever, ever felt unappreciated? Amen. Everybody should have raised their hand. Valuing the contributions of the people that are working beside you in whatever capacity in your life. They have value. They are adding to your, your growth, your development. Like you said, your brother, your friend, uh, anybody that is, is in the struggle with you uh, is, is adding value. Jesus did this. We see in Hebrews 12, 2, the Hebrew writer saying, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. In other words, he was doing this because he was doing it not for himself, but for us. And then another one. As Jesus values everyone. First, he values us more. Now, he values everyone. And we looked at Zacchaeus, who was a beautiful example of Zacchaeus, because he was a tax collector. The Jews hated him. He was an oppressor. What do you mean coming and taking taxes from me, and you're giving them to the Romans? But Jesus looked at him, and he valued uh, Zacchaeus, even though he was not you know, kind of part of their circle. Um, and then Jesus was motivated by compassion, Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus forgave. I think that is a, a, big, compo a, a big component or big quality of being a leader because sometimes those that are working with you or beside you, they're going to make mistakes. Amen. They're going to make mistakes, but you have to have the ability to uh, forgive, and that would be Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. And 21. And then as everybody mentioned how much Jesus prayed, that is a leadership quality that we could certainly take with us. So we're about uh, 10, 12 minutes over. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, cease here because each one of those points could have let us go till another 30 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time and everyone's evening. And I want to ask first off, are there any prayer requests and or announcements? I know we did announcements today. Uh, but are there any prayer requests or announcements? On the announcements perspective, I would just say please be aware that uh, the fishing trip is coming up, and uh, I don't know the date, 25th. the 25th, and then the, uh, the uh, Area Wide Church of Christ picnic is coming up the week before that on the 18th, and uh, we need to get a number to Brother Pierce, and Brother Tony, Brother Tony is going to give him, I think we were saying about 18 or so, but it, you know, it could be more. We've already paid our portion uh, but we just want to let that uh, announcement be known, Brother Tony, and I think Brother Dash. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you for that, Brother T. Also, if there, I did, uh, I speak, spoke with Alvin the other day, and I asked him about any hardship cases, speaking of helping, <laughs> and I told him to let me know, and uh, if there were any uh, youth that, you know, for some reason their family didn't have, you know, the finances or anything, I told him to let me know. Uh, we'll either try to do something, you know, privately, or we may even ask the church to do something, provided it's a legitimate, um, you know, hardship case. So uh, I haven't heard back from them yet, but if there's a couple of young people that, that want to go and they, they can't, because I think it's $60 or $65, it's $60, but they have to be there at 5.30 in the morning, right? I think it's, I think it's a, a half-day trip. Half yeah. Day okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, just let us know if there are some hardship cases, and we'll see what we can do. We'll, we'll, we'll talk with Alvin and, and get together. But Dash, that's right. That's right. Amen. Mm. Okay. Oh wow. Amen. Definitely want to pray for uh, Brother Robert and also Sister Peaches. Um, I don't know if you guys knew it. There's a note here. I didn't see it until afterwards, but they had to leave during service today. Um, they received a call um, to go to the hospital for her father. And so I saw them when they left, but I didn't know what was the reason until after service. I want to pray for them. Yes, sir. And, and, <coughs> <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good. Very good note. And the ladies can go to the fishing trip. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Any more? Any others? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Definitely pray for Brother Mark. We love Brother Mark so much, man. We just enjoy seeing him. And please pray for him. I did. Spent about a oh, half hour or so with him on the phone yesterday. He helped me get through my walk. <laughs> but let's definitely pray for Brother, Brother Whitley. Anybody else, any prayer requests? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Ricardo, Ricardo, which one is Ricardo? Oh, yes, Ricardo that came. Yes, we definitely want to pray for Ricardo. Some of you guys may not recall, but there's been a young family that's been coming the last couple of Wednesdays, a young man named Ricardo. He's going through uh, some difficult times, and we are trying to encourage him. I think, Brother Das, I think you guys got no, exchanged numbers, but let's pray for Brother Ricardo. Uh, he's just got some, some things he's going through. I'm going to leave it there, and we certainly want to pray for him. We also want to pray for Shani. Um, she has been uh, having her uh, dialysis, and sometimes the dialysis takes a lot out of her, you know, in addition to everything else that's going on. So we definitely want to pray for her. Uh, my brother, you want to close us in a word of prayer? Okay, you can grab a mic real quick. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for letting us come out to worship with you once again. Lord, be with us as we go to our many abodes that we make it home safely and return at the next appointed time. Lord, be with those who have asked for prayer, for friends, family. Be with those who are uh, going through dialysis and everything that they may uh, regain a portion of their health that they may feel better and come back and worship with us. Lord, be with those who are traveling on the highways and byways that they may make it to their destination safely and return back safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.